Okay. Uh, thank you, Per and Julie and everyone else. Um, excited to be here. And just want to make sure, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so again, my name is Hank Wilson. Um, I manage uh, the policy for parking and curb management, which really means um, all on-street parking in San Francisco. So residential permit parking, uh, metered parking, paid parking, uh, and all of the loading zones and other sort of short-term quick uses of the curb. We regulate all of those. Um, we set the policy for them. We don't do the enforcement and we don't do the, the maintenance and upkeep of all of the infrastructure that's required. Um, though that's gonna be the subject of a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, my my presentation might be a little shorter than some of the others that you've heard, um, but maybe that's a good thing since you all are at the end of a long day. Um, I was joking with Per earlier that I, I joke that I can talk about curb management all day, um, but you all are actually really putting that to the test. So um, without further ado, I'll jump in and I'll give a little bit of background about curb management and parking management in San Francisco. Um, and I think S San Francisco has been at the forefront of progressive uh, curb management policy for a while now. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that is is just luck, but it's also because, especially by American standards, San Francisco is a, a very dense, uh, congested city with a lot going on. And if we, frankly, if we don't get curb management right, then things are a mess. And this is sort of an example in this photo of, of our vital transit system getting stuck between people who are double parking because they can't find a place to park. Um, this is a picture of our mayor Latham, Latham, excuse me, back in 1947 um, in the Russian Hill neighborhood installing the very first parking meter. Um, and not a lot new came along in the next 65 years until a program called SF Park, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and it was a pilot project back in 2010 to 2012 um, that tested theories about um, demand responsive parking pricing. And it was really the first time in San Francisco and in, in, maybe in the world where a city really st started to sort of acknowledge that, that parking pricing and adjusting parking pricing and really being dynamic with how we price uh, the curb could have a big impact on things like congestion and safety and transit speed and all the things that we want to advance as an agency and as a city. Um, and it also was a, was sort of the first leap forward or big leap forward in, in many decades, at least for San Francisco, in also acknowledging that we needed new technology in order to make, in order to sort of forward all of these goals that we had. Um, and so that included an app that would tell drivers where parking was available and how much it would cost. Um, new meters that could accept credit cards and uh, parking cards that the agency uh, puts out and uh, pay by phone. Uh, we've recently upgraded some of our meters and are working on more uh, to accept contactless payment. So really understanding that um, making it easier to pay and making the customer experience of parking and using the curb easier was a, a, a basic first step in, in sort of our ability to be more progressive about curb policy and um, achieve a lot of these goals uh, that the city has. But uh, despite all of those advances, the, the basic infrastructure, the sort of traditional infrastructure, uh, hasn't really changed that much. Uh, we've got nicer meters. We take prettier pictures now. Um, but there, this the infrastructure that we use to manage parking, especially in our commercial districts, is still based on on a very traditional sort of notion of people coming to a commercial district, parking their cars, getting out, walking up to the meter, paying, and then staying for a couple hours as they go to lunch or go shopping or something like that. Um, or and, and so what that means is that we have all of this traditional infrastructure out on the street, which carries pretty substantial costs. Uh, one is that that infrastructure, and by that I mean, you know, mostly the meters, they're pretty ugly. Um, they take up a lot of space. They uh, impede paths of travel for people with disabilities and others, especially on our on our narrower sidewalks. Um, and they cost a lot of money to install and uh, maintain. I was talking to uh, one of my colleagues who manages the 
the contract that we have with the meter vendor and he said you know what uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that these are just computers on sticks out all around the city um and we've got 28,000 of those little computers on sticks and so that's a lot of upkeep um sitting out there in the sun in the rain subject to you know all sorts of uh kind of antisocial behavior um and so when we we have to spend a lot of money to collect all the coins out of the meters and we've been spending increasing amounts of money over the past few years repairing pretty substantial damage that we see um you know we, we have this ranges from uh people stuffing cotton or or paper towels in a coin slot all the way to ripping out the the large battery in a, one of our multi-space machines as you see here so a lot of costs involved in maintaining all of this um pretty pretty old school, pretty traditional infrastructure out on the streets. Um, but it also means that when you have traditional infrastructure that you're only really targeting traditional users. Um, and it's like I was talking about before, it's the, it's the folks who are just coming into a commercial district kind of the same way that they might have in 1947, uh, driving in from some other neighborhood or from some other town to enjoy the city, park, get out, have lunch, go shopping in, in the big city, that sort of thing. Uh, or um, targeting merchants, you know, folks who who have establishments on the streets who are making our streets uh, interesting and vibrant and and a place that people want to be, um, who need to unload their goods and they need to, you know, stop a truck for an extended period of time in order to load and unload. Those are really the only users who we're able to target right now. And they're again, like I said, they're the same users that have been around since the 1940s, and we. What we haven't done is is adjusted our infrastructure and our technology to kind of acknowledge all these new users, which basically means anybody since 1947. So UPS and FedEx, or DoorDash, or Uber, or any of the, any of the other um, these sorts of new curb users that have really flourished in the last few years, almost to to a company they don't pay at the curb. Um, they take advantage of the fact that the curb is there. They take advantage of the fact that the maintenance and installation and enforcement and all the money that we spend to maintain that curb infrastructure keeps spaces available. They certainly take advantage of that and they take advantage of the fact that the curb provides them access to these vibrant, uh, active commercial districts where, frankly, it makes it a money-making proposition to deliver people and goods to these places. So they're they're deriving all the benefits they're also you know they have they have costs there's wear and tear on the streets there's their you know double parking as you can see in these pictures and blocking traffic blocking bike lanes blocking um, our transit vehicles uh, so they're imposing lots of costs and they're reaping lots of benefits and they're really not paying for anything and a lot of that has to do again with this the fact that we just haven't upgraded our infrastructure to sort of address these these new users and the way they use the curb since so many of them use the curb in such a sh for such a short period of time you know it's it's really just a time thing if you're coming in and you're dropping someone off for 15 seconds or you're jumping out of the car to grab a meal and getting back in and that takes you two or three minutes there's very little chance that you're going to walk up to a parking meter and pay it for two or three minutes um and frankly our, our parking rates right now are, are low enough they're they're sort of based on if you're staying for an hour or more so if uh if uh, parking costs two dollars an hour and you're only staying for two minutes um that's that's going to be so little money that it's probably not worth it to you to make the effort and so this sort of mismatch between our infrastructure and new users of the curb is what motivated us to to promulgate this curb management strategy that um we got approved by the agency's board of directors back in February 2020, um, which of course now feels like, you know, 30 years ago um, in the, the before times, the pre-COVID times. Um, but this was really an acknowledgement that our, our curb management strategies, our curb management policies have not kept up with all of the new uses that are happening out there on the curb. Um, and so this is essentially a policy document that provides guidelines about how we will allocate curb space in San Francisco and how we'll do it, sort of acknowledging all of these new users and acknowledging a lot of the benefits that they bring and, and it, of course, acknowledging the, some of the costs that they impose as well. And it proposes an extensive set of recommendations about things that we can do, ranging from very sort of mundane internal policy changes to changes to the city transportation code or the California state vehicle code um, all the way up to fairly fairly radical um, changes in the way that we do business. 
Um, and the one that's most relevant to, to what I'm talking about today is objective 5.1, which was uh, looking at pricing to address curb use impacts. And I'm, of course, we're of course not the only people to think about this. And um, I talk to private sector partners all the time. Lots of people have big ideas about how about sort of how we can price the curb, how you can manage the curb to, to make things move more smoothly and efficiently. Um, but oftentimes I am pitched something like what you see here, um, which involves basically a lot of infrastructure, um, lots of cameras and sensors and Bluetooth devices and wireless routers and all the poles that you would need to put them on and all the power that you would need to, to power all of those devices. And to me, this feels like kind of repeating a lot of the, of the same concerns that I just expressed about the parking meters, that it's just a lot of stuff out on the streets. It takes up a lot of space. Um, it costs a lot of money to install and maintain. And in San Francisco, where vandalism seems to be uh, a special problem, uh, you have the risk of, of these things getting vandalized or destroyed or, or taken away. Um, and they, it also adds, adds the extra uh, concern about um, surveillance and privacy. Um, which is not not the subject of what I'm going to talk about today, but just another reason why um, going going the route of of adding even more, trying to add even more infrastructure to the streets to track and and observe all of the the usage of the curb that's going on um, seems seems like something that is seems like a not not quite the right route in my opinion, especially in in a time like these where we have such incredible uh, budget crises where we're not, the city's not going to have a lot of money to acquire lots of new infrastructure and maintain it. And it also seems unnecessary given that everybody has, uh, you know, sort of an observation tracking device in, in their car or in their pocket in the form of a smartphone. And, and that so many private sector partners are already using that to, to improve, to, you know, sort of direct uh, drivers, to improve uh, customer service, and to really create um, to create markets out of out of whole cloth that didn't exist before for people who want to be uh, moved around or goods that need to be moved around, um, and so, in, sort of in an ideal scenario, which I think um, makes a lot of intuitive sense, um, in the ideal scenario where everybody has a smartphone or everybody has some sort of like wireless enabled device in their vehicle, um, things are pretty simple. You know, the the, the their movements of cars, wh wh whether they be large delivery trucks or personal vehicles that are dropping off people like, as an Uber or something like that, are, are tracked. And whenever somebody stops at the curb to drop someone off or to deliver goods or to pick up a meal or whatever it is, um, that's automatically logged. And whatever the price is for the use of that curb space gets automatically debited from their account, automatically sent to the city. Um, all of the, those records are, are kept by the city and used for enforcement, for really for streamlining enforcement, so that it's not just a, a game of a sort of a hunting game and a, and a, um, a game of uh, seeing if you can avoid getting caught. And I think you know, in the in the especially ideal scenario, you don't even really need enforcement anymore. If every if every car or every uh, driver is connected to the system, then everybody's just paying. Um, and so they're the idea of somebody using a space without paying for it just sort of goes away. Now that's the ideal, and that's an, that's under the assumption that everybody um, has access to the things that they need in order to make that ideal come true. Um, something like uh, in-vehicle navigation systems or smartphones or whatever. Um, but that that sort of technology and the the things that are necessary to to make it possible aren't accessible to to a lot of San Franciscans. Um, and you know, there's really two major equity um, issues that that this kind of ideal scenario of curb pricing presents. Um, and the one is that right now everybody's getting it for free. Uh, there, people are getting to use the curb for free. They're getting to do drop-offs for free, uh, pickups, and everything else. Um, and so that means that um, that means that if we start charging for it, then we're charging for something that used to be free. And this is something that we face in the in the more traditional parking realm all the time that people don't like paying for something that used to be free. Um, but the second one is what I'm more interested in uh, for purposes of this this whole discussion, um, that it requires access to technology and it also requires access to bank accounts and credit cards. Um, and there there is a small but very significant slice of, of San Francisco 
that doesn't have that. And it's also something that is is really um, on the minds of policymakers in the city. Um, the the idea of the unbanked um, and the idea of folks who don't have smartphones uh, being it's kind of a class of people that we really need to watch out for and worry about is 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 an important one in San Francisco. Uh, and a couple of years ago, the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, which is a, the city council for the city, uh, passed a law saying that all brick and mortar retailers must accept cash. They may not be allowed to only accept you know credit card or phone payments or anything like that. And actually, it, that required um, a couple of Amazon stores in the city to kind of retrofit their stores with an ability, with a cash register to take cash. So there's not a lot of um, appetite at the at the political level or at the sort of the elected official level in San Francisco for for moving away um, from cash, and it's understandable. Um, and so, really, uh, I unfortunately this this presentation is more about questions than answers because, like I said, we as a city have not actually moved um, to in in this direction as much as I would like, and I think. Um, like I said, we're still using the traditional infrastructure of, of, of parking meters where you walk up and pay. And we've done a lot of thinking about it. And I will say that the the main uh, sort of progress or, or uh, achievement that I can cite is that we're actually having the conversation. You know, I, I have been working at the SF Municipal Transportation Agency for about 10 years now. And the conversation has distinctly moved from uh, one where we said we need to, you know, we'd love to get rid of cash and meters, and we'd love to start requiring everybody to pay by phone, and we'd love to get rid of all of the parking meters and, and you know, all that sort of stuff, and citing statistics like only 13% of people use cash anyway, or the smartphone adoption rate in San Francisco is the highest of any American city. So really, it's just a small number of people that that are would be impacted, and and so we can just go ahead and move on and move into the kind of the next century on this. Um, but that's really sort of the point, you know, the, the point of, of these conversations about equity and being inclusive um, and how we move forward. The whole point is, yes, it may be a small segment of the population, but those are the people that we are should be most concerned about because those are the people who are most on the margins. Those are the people who could who would be completely left out if we if we moved on. Um, and so, you know, I've got a lot of ideas about ways that we can start to adopt a new technology that would actually allow us to do um, some uh, better curb management. And I think that there is a, there's also an equity component in the fact that, like I said, we're really only charging more traditional users and that leaves out all, all these companies. Frankly, a lot of them are fleets. A lot of them are large companies. A lot of them have a lot of money who could be able to, who would are more equipped to pay um, curb charges than some of the traditional users that we actually are able to charge right now. Uh, but I also have a lot of other um, ideas about ways to move uh, towards new curb management technology. Uh, the main issue is that they all cost money. Um, and that's kind of the, that is the, the stumbling block that I run into when I'm talking about these issues within um, my agency, especially right now, um, you know, during a, a, a budget crisis. But I think the question that we need to be asking is it may, it may cost money um, in order to, you know, provide provide parking cards to, to everybody who needs one or everybody who makes under a certain amount of money or something like that. Um, but is that going to cost us more money than we spend on installation, maintenance, uh, vandalism, repair of meters, uh, or uh, the the connectivity uh, fees that we pay to our meter vendors to keep them all connected to our data warehouse and things like that? We spend a lot of money just keeping those meters up and running. Um, and if we could get rid of them all, then it might be worth it to spend uh, actually quite a bit of money to make sure that we're doing it in an inclusive way. So that's that's what I've got. Um, I, again, thank you very much for your time. I really look forward to, to hearing um, Aaron's thoughts on this and, and your questions. And with that, I will conclude. I'd say thank you. Here's my contact information if you're interested. And I will now stop showing my screen. Okay, thank you very much, Hank. Thanks a lot. Uh, now over to you, Aaron. And Great, thanks. Let me just start this slideshow. Now you should be a presenter as well. Okay. And 
So now are you seeing my full presentation? Yes, we are. Great. Thanks. Um, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening. Um, so it's interesting um, what I what we've been working on um, is a bit more broad than just curbside management, but it intersects um, in some interesting ways in the payment, in the reservation, the trip planning, and some of that location um, kind of app and software uh, question that Hank brought up. So I'm going to kind of focus in just on that. Um, and, and we, um, and I'll give a little background um, into what started this project. I just want to quickly introduce my my co-researchers uh, on this project. So I'm Aaron Golub, I'm a school director and associate professor in urban studies at Portland State University. And then Ann Brown down at University of Oregon, uh, Candace Brakewood at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and John MacArthur, my colleague here at Portland State. Um, and the broad um, you know, motivation for this project is we see uh, public agencies with a public mission funded by public money um, increasingly move to automated payment reservation information trip planning and some last mile connectivity services that require now private uh, services such as private internet smartphone uh, data plans and banking and credit services. And these were issues that Hank raised uh, in, the, in the curbside management um, issue in San Francisco. So we're asking basically what steps can be taken to ensure universal access to the, to the private side of this equation. Um, and it's not so simple. And I'll just give a little, um, before I jump in, um, broadly in the United States, and I, I'm not exactly sure where all of the audience is from, but we have civil rights regulations at the federal level that um, prohibit discrimination for public service providers that receive any federal funding. Um, so things like education, uh, hospitals that might receive some federal funding, um, school, uh, schools, um, prisons, anywhere that's receiving federal funding, they, um, the federal law prohibits um, discrimination based on race, ethnicity, or national origin. Um, but it doesn't include things like age or, or kind of technological um, proficiency or connectivity to internet. And so as um, our public providers are increasingly relying on these private services, um, it, it kind of begins to question whether these are uh, disparities that that kind of start to um, that would disobey the federal regulation around uh, discrimination, um, and it doesn't seem that they do because of the way the discrimination laws are written. But and and as a specific example, age is not a dimension of, of enforceable discrimination. But we're seeing in the work that I'll show now, age is a big dimension of exclusion uh, when, you, when you look at emerging technologies like smartphone, internet. So I'll, I'll jump into that, but have that in the background of your mind. Um, so our, this project is focused on transit riders. And it was a, it, I just wanted just to name the funders, the city of Eugene, Oregon, or Oregon. Uh, Gresham, Oregon, uh, Lane Transit District, which is in Eugene, um, a, a clever consulting group in Portland, Regional Transit District of Denver, Colorado in the U.S., and our institute here at Portland State. And so, like I said, the motivation here is around the payment technologies. Um, as I said, public transit agencies are moving to these automated technologies. Of course, we know about how they smooth operations, they improve convenience, and they, they improve data collection, which could in turn improve planning even better. Um, but what about those who can't adopt these new technologies? And are there reasonable, what we might call equity mitigations? Uh, and how cost effective are those mitigations? So that's what this project is trying to answer. And I just want to go into a brief background, kind of so you understand the US context in terms of some of this access to technology more broadly, not just transit users. Uh, and so we just kind of gathered some big picture data 
Uh, when we look at access to banking and credit, which Hank did mention as a key issue in, in their concern in San Francisco, we do see pretty big disparities. Uh, some of the, the typical disparities we see in the US, which is race and class, white households, higher income households have better access to banking and credit. But we also do see some age disparities, um, higher, uh, older population, better access to banking. But we have this interesting with credit, we have very young and very old with lower access to credit cards. So that is something we should be concerned about moving to automated payment and reservation systems. Um, when we look at digital divide, so things like smartphone, internet, uh, data plans, um, the, those traditional disparities are not quite as strong. Uh, we do see some mild uh, income and race disparities um, around smartphone ownership, but that in some studies, actually our non-white households have higher access to uh, smartphones. But we do see a big age disparity in smartphones. Um, interesting in the opposite younger have higher access to smartphones and we'll talk about that in a moment when i look at our specific study in terms of self service um, we see a big income disparity and, and actually a race disparity but with a large uh, a large group of households that do let their services lapse because of data plan limits or the quality of their uh, data plans which might be um, month to month or, or different kinds of uh, so lower quality access. And then in terms of internet access at home, um, there are some significant disparities with our African-American households with lower access, our higher income households, higher access. And then we can see some age disparities. Um, higher, uh, older age have higher access, but then it tapers off. Um, at higher, higher um, ages. So those are some interesting things we should be aware of. And then finally, just very quickly in terms of using new mobility services like bike share and car share and um, transportation network companies, the um, ride, ride sharing. Um, if we, this top uh, row here is just general access to services, are they available? And we don't see a lot of disparities in terms of availability because they're kind of everywhere as you as you know. Uh, but when we look at use of, um, there's a lot of studies that do show there's some mild um, income disparities and some not significant race and ethnicity disparities, but we do see disparities in the use by age. Uh, so older populations are using these services less. And again, this might tie into some of the technological uh, proficiency issues like smartphone that, that I talked about couple slides ago. So that motivates our research project. Um, we, we do want to, I'm going to focus on the question here, uh, the second question, how do automated payment systems impact or exclude different populations? We're looking at age, income, race, ethnicity. Um, we looked a little bit at geography. I'm not going to talk about that here, uh, depending on where they live and work. Uh, we'll, we, we will look at technology, smartphone, and internet access and banking, and we do go into language a little bit. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the mitigation strategies at the very end. We're just kind of into that phase of the project now. Um, so we were working in the, the three cities that were funding this project, Portland, Denver, and Eugene, Oregon. Uh, we did two focus groups in Portland and then one in Eugene, I'll talk about that. And then I'll very quickly gleaned some results from our uh, large sample survey in the three cities, we did about 2,200 surveys. So just the results from the focus groups, which were 90 minute long, you know, deep conversations with around a dozen people uh, about these issues. Um, two in Portland, actually in the city of Gresham, which is just east of Portland, and then in one in Eugene. Um, and some big picture um, issues that came out of those discussions of course, we talked a lot about transit affordability, access in terms of spatial access, time of day, um, scheduling issues, and those are always really important for transit users. But when, it, when we move to kind of the technology issues, trust is a really strong concern on the part of these um, transit riders. So they, 
when we talk about moving to automated systems using smartphones, they're, they're, they're um, concerned about tracking, uh, loss of the phone, loss of the data, loss of the information that's in the phone, uh, credit card numbers, um, theft of the phone, uh, theft of account of balances that might be connected to the phone, data privacy, battery power was a big issue. What happens if the battery runs out? They almost they would be stranded. Uh, and and when you're on transit, you are out in the world without your own vehicle, and so that is a thing. Um, and so we have to kind of take that into account. And and some of these things, as we know, the the privacy and the uh, how the phones work. Um, some of these things might not actually be a, a real issue, um, but even but still they're in the minds of these users and we need to take those into account. Uh, discomfort using new payment systems. So they're just uncomfortable using them, uh, using the phone. We were, we had really interesting conversations about how they use the phone and a lot of them don't even realize that you can load new applications onto a phone. Uh, many of them, a significant number, maybe a quarter of the people that we converse with, think that the phone is as it is. They buy the phone, it has the applications, and that is how it is permanently configured. Uh, they're also uncomfortable calling in or using websites to um, load payment information or to pay for tickets or other things. So that uh, is important to understand. And then identity theft, which is related to what I just talked about, but we have to realize for many planners, we think of identity theft, we call our bank, we you know get the charges removed, there might be a hold. But for low-income households that are often using not even the formal banking that we use, or maybe accounts or you know that, that, that are less um, permanent, that, that identity theft can be devastating. You know, it can be me meaning, you know, losing their their um, their rental uh, or being you know evicted or something so I think we need to recognize that it's it's very different for the populations that we're working with uh, than than us as professionals um, understanding fair media this is more of a transit issue but how transit tickets work um, there was some issues around not understanding that but I'll, I'll skip that uh, again lack of access to data and internet so we had people who use smartphones and they actually do not use data plans. They will purchase a, a, a phone minute only plan that does not allow any data. Oh, that mean they can use Wi-Fi, but uh, any kind of data plan on a cell uh, connection. So that was interesting. I didn't even know those kind of plans existed and apparently they do. Uh, diverse uses of smartphones, like I said, some do not add any applications, don't know that you can. And then I think there was a general concern about losing cash as this backup. And so as we move to automation, full automation, that they, they think of cash as this, this universal backup that they could use if their smartphone battery were to die or something like that. And they were also concerned about tourists, although tourists may be higher income and actually ready to adopt new technologies more than the, the transit riders than we talked to. We talk to. Our large sample survey, I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, but we did um, intercept surveys at transit stops in the three cities, about 2,200 in our sample. Then we did an equity analysis to understand how the differences in experiences, uh, how the experiences differed between the two, between three dimensions, age, race and ethnicity, and income. Age we knew would be a factor, and that's why we kind of focus on it. I'll talk about millennials that are under 35 years old, Gen X, which is was 35 to 55 year old, and then baby boomers. Again, these are demographics in the U.S. context that are over 55 years old uh, today. And then race ethnicity, again within the U.S. context, we call these non-Hispanic uh, white households or households of color, um, people of color, which is a broad. Um, category for non-white folks. And then we have our low income, which are um, incomes below $50,000 per year. And so some punchlines from the large sample survey, um, and I'll just go through these uh, one by one. Transit riders are actually similarly resourced to the general population. Um, their median income is similar, a little bit lower, but um, you know they have um, 
some of the same access to smartphones overall as the general population. Uh, in fact, we, maybe where ours was a little higher than the national average. Uh, but again, this might be an urban-rural thing. These are all urban folks, um, so they, they maybe have better adaptation adaptation than uh, rural rural populations. But um, yeah, so then a significant number, though, still about 30% of our sample relied heavily on paying cash on the bus. Um, and and when we asked, most did appear that they could switch to non-cash options such as smartphones or um, using the ticket vending machines with credit cards only, but a significant number, it was a few percent of our overall sample, insisted that they could not ride transit anymore if there were no cash options. It was if we moved completely to automated smartphone or credit card at, at vending machine uh, systems, no more cash. Um, so like I said, smartphone ownership among the whole group was high, over 80% for all groups, and that's similar to the national data. But a small but significant number, um, about 20%, were concerned, even though they have smartphones, they're concerned about reaching data limits. And they, so they have some of these less expensive plans that have small data limits. And a significant number rely only on public Wi-Fi for internet. They do not have internet at home. They use uh, cafes, libraries, uh, the free Wi-Fi connections for their internet, and they're using their smartphones for their internet, so they don't have a home computer. And so that, that was surprising to us. Um, about uh, one in seven don't have access to formal banking, and that's actually similar to our national data. Um, so that would be important for, you know, systems that are connecting to credit or banking, um, uh, you know, accounts where you really want to tie in those account information with the payment and uh, systems to kind of streamline those. And then um, when we asked on the large sample survey about comfort using um, systems, um, we did have a general unease storing credit information in websites and smartphones similar to the focus groups that came up. So there are some of these important disparities. Low income respondents had low access, lower access to smartphones uh, in internet and banking. Our older respondents had significantly lower access to smartphones and internet, uh, significantly less, even less than the income disparity. And some of these disparities differed a little bit from city to city, but not, not hugely. They were some of the same patterns. So some of our implications here, um, age and income related exclusion are the most troubling. Local conditions do vary from city to city. Um, based on the focus groups and the survey, it's clear that education and training will be key to lowering anxiety, improving adoption um, and understanding of the new systems and really using them properly. Although public Wi-Fi could be a really important link to kind of lower uh, to lower that anxiety, and then we should maybe even be, be um, entertaining the idea of free or subsidized smartphones, like we do with telecom and energy, where, where people used to get free phones, and we used to, we do still subsidize energy and telecom in the U.S. What about internet, and what about smartphones, if they're so important for some of these very important public functions? And very quickly, we are moving to kind of the cost-effectiveness analysis of our project, and I know I'm almost out of time. Um, and so we're looking at what are these, how do agencies work around some of these barriers? Like, can they accept cash through retail stores that could add access, where people, if they desperately need to use cash, they could still load like a, an account using cash at retail stores or, or, or public offices like libraries or other things? We are looking also at the cost of adding cash at some ticket vending machines, but those are very expensive to provide and may not be cost effective compared to the marginal uh, fare that they, they collect from those. And then again, we want to focus heavily on education, free Wi-Fi and smartphones and looking, those seem to be very cost effective. Uh, the more we can get folks on board in that way. So I'm just gonna stop there and um, we go back to the uh, questions and answers and 
Thanks. Thank you very much, Aaron. I think you could uh, go back one slide, actually, because oh. that uh, would be helpful. If you want to keep okay. presenting, you can have that uh, hanging there in the background. Okay, so I should leave my slides on? Yeah, the, go back one, back one slide to the yeah. one with your, that one, yes. Or this one? Yeah, no, that one, the other okay. one, this one, yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know, Hank, we briefly touched upon possible mitigations when we spoke uh, uh, a few weeks ago, but have you, what, what, what kind of mitigations have you yourself considered already? Um, yeah, a great question, and thanks, Aaron. Uh, that, that was really informative. Uh, I've jotted down a few notes of things like, oh, I, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Um, and I'll just note one of those. One of the things that I hadn't really thought of was that even people who have smartphones may not actually know how to use them or install apps. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about what's the smartphone penetration rate, um, but that may not actually tell us the full story about what's the actual population of people who can effectively use this and, and interact with the apps that we're requiring them to interact with or whatever. Um, I mean, you know, San Francisco is a, is a, is a progressive place um, generally. I'm, the, the treasurer's office has done a lot of really cool things around equity. They have a program called Bank on San Francisco, which is all about getting, you know, trying to get people hooked up with bank accounts, um, folks who might otherwise be maybe, you know, intimidated by the system. Uh, there's also some options for getting a, a debit card uh, with no, as far as I can tell, no fees and a very low minimum, I think $25 where you can, it's not really a bank account. It's just it's just purely a debit card and you can put money on it. Um, I think a lot of the, there, so there are a lot of options and you know, that frankly, in at least in the United States, there's, there's, um, there's Visa, you know, prepaid debit cards that you can buy. Um, so there's, there are options out there. Um, I think the main questions that, that we have are, um, is it, are we, even though there may be options, are we making those options too difficult to take advantage of? Um, and what are, what are things that we as the city can do? And again, I think the city has done a lot, but still has a long way to go in terms of reaching out to, to all the folks who may need some of these services. Um, but like, are we, in the in the context of of parking and transit, you know, are we making it possible to reload that debit card at a place near where you would actually need to park or take the bus, or are we putting a lot of locations in all of the neighborhoods where people actually live? Um, you know, because if you have to, if we have this option of a debit card, but there's only four locations in the city where you can load it, is that sort of is that equal access? You know. Um, so there's there are a lot of really good ideas, and I think it's really just frankly, as with so many of these things, like we just need to invest more money in getting getting the word out to more people and providing more outlets in more places in the city where people can can access them. Well, I read that you already have uh, you have already have pre twenty dollar prepaid cards, uh, but. Um, is that the ones you're referring to? Because when and on your web page it says that you have to have a credit or debit card to to um, top them up or to buy them. But is it that that won't be the same case if you do it uh, in in store? Um, no. So we do have the the SFMTA has a our, our what we call our parking card that we've had for a long time, and you can you can load it up with cash uh, at certain locations around the city, um, and. So that is always an option for people. There's there is a twenty dollar minimum, uh, which you know there's there's that issue. Some people don't have twenty dollars. Um, I think you know you you do start to run into some issues of like if if a twenty dollar minimum is too low, um, anything less than twenty dollars, you're not getting very many hours of parking on the street in San Francisco because it's it's not it's not cheap in a lot of places to park in the city. So. Um, it, it, there may, I, you know, I think the, I do think that the sort of the audience of folks or the or the universe of people that we're, that we're worried about does get smaller and smaller as like, you know, the, if we're talking about, and I think that's important to, to focus on and say like, well, are, if we're talking about people who, who don't have $20, but are parking on the street at a parking meter that costs $4.75 an hour, 
like are there really do really really any of those people exist or how many do how many are there and there may be so few that you could actually literally go find them and and figure something out with them individually you know and really get into like what is the what what is what's the barrier that you're facing and how can we how can we help address that yeah but the background for you bringing this up it there must be a, a, a is this really sensitive to talk about with politicians or um, mm -hmm. or um, local NGOs I don't know is this something you always run into? Yeah, I th I think so. I mean, I I will being quite frank. Um, when I first started this work, I I was frustrated because it also felt like, um, and it, well, maybe this is a way to put it that like I have a little bit of an ulterior motive. I think that th I actually really care about these things and think that they're really important and and that we need to be able to ex expanding access to everybody who needs it. But I also think that people tend to lean on on equity arguments even when they don't they may not apply to the person who's making the argument that if if i if even if if i'm somebody who has plenty of money i just don't want to pay for parking in front of my store or something like that i can kind of raise the straw man of the person who doesn't have any money but needs to park in front of my store or doesn't have access to to cash and so i think it's both the right thing to do to address this issue but it also helps advance some of these, you know, that's sort of the point of my converse, of my presentation is that we're a little bit stuck in, you know, we 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 are stuck with this traditional infrastructure which takes cash um, because we have this mindset that cash is the only thing that that some people can use. Um, but if we're able to address those issues, then not only can we, not only are we solving issues for people who need who need help, but we're also kind of clearing out the, some of the objections to to moving forward and starting to charge uh, for more curb use and charge in more places and things like that, and and doing things that I think would have beneficial outcomes for the city as a whole, would raise money so that we could run more transit service, which you know is is the real backbone of how people get around and is frankly how most low income people are making their way around San Francisco. Yeah, I think for us the when we finally you know cross tabulated who would eventually be excluded completely? It was only about 3% of all riders could not transition to some kind of automated payment in our calculation. It was like of the 30% that currently pay cash, which is way higher, I'm sure, than your rate, um, only about 10% of them were absolutely excluded. And so when you talked about kind of drilling in on who, that would be a, a really important um, project to try and identify them. I bet it would be fewer than 3% for you. But the challenge, I think, is that um, the, your drivers are often also low income because they're not able to live near high quality transit. And as you know, in the Bay Area, high quality transit means high cost housing. Right. And so you, you are going to have a, an interesting cross tabulation of low income drivers, although most of them will be high income drivers, um, especially in San Francisco, if they're owning a car, it's, it's probably high income folks, but if they're driving in from the peninsula or you know where the, qu the quality of transit outside of the main corridors is not good, they're gonna be low income. So you could almost do you know like a license plate analysis or something to try and find folks who are, um, you know, coming in on off shifts to do cleaning at night in offices, the transit is bad. They're having to pay the $5 an hour and maybe try to really target them. Uh -huh. uh, maybe maybe through employers and say, who are your cleaners at night? Who are your third shift? And we, we wanna give them just universal access. Cause you know, parking at night, I mean, you do have residential overflow and it's probably hard to park at night. But there may be a way you could have a program that could be identified through employers because um, you know low-income folks are probably not going to drive in if they aren't forced to you know at four dollars an hour or what you know but they're probably working they're probably going to work yeah so I don't absolutely know my first thought about this no, you're absolutely right and and, uh, and we certainly encounter you know a lot of that in in our discussions and you know it it um if I may, it sort of makes me, I, it reminds me of a of kind of a, a thought process that I had or a thought experiment um, in, in 
that developed in in the context of a parking management like outreach process that we were doing in a neighborhood which I actually live in now, but is is a kind of the epicenter of of gentrification in San Francisco, and and it's also the epicenter of of formerly industrial uh, spaces becoming you know residential or retail, and so there's just much more a lot more stuff happening than there used to be, and so the old way of no parking regulations and no curb regulations because there just wasn't anybody there um, doesn't really make sense anymore but people are attached to those those old ways and and i said you know i think um if you really break it down into all of the different sorts of um like categories of people who are impacted by say parking or curb pricing you've got um You've got all the folks who are driving in from somewhere else because they just want to drive here, use the free parking, and get on the train and go downtown. Um, you know, we we don't actually want those people because they're not they're not contributing anything. They don't live here. They're not spending money here. They don't work here. They're not actually contributing anything other than just using the free parking. So good, you know, get them out of here. We've got all the new you know gentrifiers who have lots of money and probably have access to garages. Not really worried about them either because they have a place that they can put their car off street. Uh, you have people, frankly, like my wife and I at the time who have a car that we never use, but we leave it on the street because it's free. And if it cost us money, we'd probably get rid of it. That's probably a good policy outcome, too. And so what you're left with is really it's like it's the folks who don't have access to a garage it's the, and, and have a job that requires them to to use their car. And and that's kind of the thing is rather than and again, I think I think the advance that we've made is a few years ago, we would have said, well, that's a really small number of people, so we're not going to worry about it. And now we say that's a really small number of people, and now we can go figure out who they are and talk to them and figure something out. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, that's a question in my head. You, you, you of course, have numbers of of, of um, the usage of different payment solutions you have, uh, and I mean, referring to what Aaron said about how many would it be absolutely excluded. Uh, do do you see a way for you to find out that level for 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 parking for you? Um, I think I think we would need you know the kind of study that Aaron and his team have done, where we go. I mean, we have we have the numbers on what percentage of people pay with with credit card um, or the parking card or pay by phone or cash, um, and it's it's you know the cash number has been dropping every year. Um, and so we could, I think essentially we would need to go out and do intercept surveys and things like that to talk to the people who are paying cash and say, you know, why are you paying cash? Um, why don't you take advantage of any of these other options? Um, if we got rid of the cash option, but, you know, gave you these other things as a replacement, would that work for you? You know, um, that's the kind of real, like, that's the kind of work we need to do. It's not the kind of work that is typically in a, you know, like the public agency budget. Um, but again, I think that's that's part of this whole discussion is that equity and worrying about that sort of slim uh, section of people hasn't has always been the last thing that we fund. And I think now we we really need to move into a a new era where we say, you know, th these are the this, these are just as important as the people who are able to roll up and pay seven dollars an hour with their credit card you know um and yeah so i think that's it's, it's really just like sort of getting getting out there and talking to people and figuring out what the, what their challenges are and also i think meeting with with our colleagues at the treasurer's office who have already done a lot of thinking about this and would love to talk to aaron more you know after this about his thoughts and, and that one more thing i'll say is that um we as Aaron pointed out, this is actually a much bigger issue for our transit division than it is for parking. I mean, it, it would be great if we could, you know, get rid of the costs and the annoyance of having to accept cash at parking meters, but the costs and challenges of accepting cash on the buses and the trains is much, 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 much higher, you know. But you also control the, the public transit. Is Could you see a future where you combine efforts and have the same card for using for paying prepaid on transit and for parking. Yeah, I think that that's I think that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, we have a um, 
most major cities have like a that's the, the standard transit card now you know like i guess it's the it's like the oyster card in london and um in san francisco in the bay area it's called the clipper card and we are right now it just works on most of the transit agencies in the bay area it doesn't work um for for parking um or or any other things i know like the one in hong kong i can't remember the name of it but you know you can go to a store and buy it buy a dress or something with the with that card um we are currently working on upgrading the the clipper card you know the clipper 2.0 project is is happening and so i'm you know want to be involved in those conversations to see if if we can expand the scope of what that card can be used for and also expand the scope of who will have access to it Hank, have the civil rights dimensions been brought up um, in terms of Title VI and some of the federal issues? They're, they're often brought up in transit, but I'm wondering if any constituents have brought them up in on the curbside. No, uh, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, Title VI is a, is a you know, federal American law that, you know, I, well, Aaron, you would know better, but it essentially says that you can't, you can't, institute policies that would discriminate against people based on protected classes like race and um, yeah, other things race and national origin actually income is not in it right and age um, is certainly not in it right so, um, um but the, it only applies to federally funded uh programs that we have so all of our transit gets a lot of federal dollars but our parking meters don't and so we you know, for better or for worse, we don't have to do a Title VI analysis. Okay. Um, but like I said, you know, like I said in the presentation, there's, at least locally, there's a lot of concern. I mean, you know, like we're, the the elected officials in San Francisco are moving towards forcing more people to accept cash. They're not moving in the other direction right now, you know. Hmm, interesting. Specifically for the, um, for the reasons that you've articulated that, you know, that there are people who, if if a store says you have to pay with credit card or with your smartphone, then then you're excluding people. Yeah. Yeah, I was in the Netherlands last summer and and noticed that their transit is completely cashless, I believe. And it was it was pretty interesting to observe. Um, you know, they're they're just Europe is far ahead of us, and we we could learn a lot about whatever education and, and outreach that they've been doing um i don't know i don't want to My go life. on a tangent but it, it's it's a decade ahead of us mm -hmm. i would say yes in, in some regards i mean at first glance i, I think i i feel it as well i, I mean the city of mama where in, we, they have incrementally over the last few years they have first they they uh, scrap the possibility to pay by cash in all parking meters, we have we're not been able to pay uh, by cash in, in public transit for at least I don't know five or six years, mm -hmm. and and there are different reasons for that for for facing that out. But um, I also feel well when speaking and listening to you that we might well look, there are of course several explanations to why we can have a cashless system in higher regard and you one being that maybe of course we have a higher penetration of of uh, cell phone usage with 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 like not uh, data limited plans as you have um of course but and we are, don't have the the same levels of unbanked people i think it's i, I actually <laughs> didn't hear about this before talking to you um and also, but but on the other side, I think also we have maybe um, a higher trust in the government in um, uh, in providing for us. So we trust them doing the right choices. And in that sense, I think that we don't have the same level of of um, uh, uh, local rights group or civil rights groups interfering, if you could say that, in in, in planning. So, because we, of course, have the same problems as you are, are talking about. Uh, not maybe like they are underbanked, but uh, people not being able to use their smartphone in the right way. Or maybe they can download an app, but they can't understand how to do it. And I, in that sense, I don't think we maybe are so much far ahead of you. We are actually kind of behind you. 
Hmm. In a sense. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm glad that you, Hank, said that uh, you wanted to talk more with Aaron. You could feel free to do it here and now, but um, if we do not have any more questions to each other uh, at this moment, I would uh, like to, to thank you for, for taking your time uh, and, and, and talking to us and sharing your situation, Hank, and, and your research, Aaron. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, getting back to you and, and hear more about your results later. Um, this winter, I suspect, maybe. Yes, we, we finished our project in December, so we'll, I can send you the final report. And I would be glad to do have a presentation at TRB as well if you make it, or no, it's it's all virtual, so you can stay in Europe and join us. <laughs> do you want well, us I, to remain on the discussion right now for the next little while? Do you want us to yeah, sure. right now? I mean, because I know that you had said we might this theme might go for another uh, 25 minutes, so I don't know. Well, you we could keep on going. I you see I have some some comments here as well. And, yeah. Um, well, yeah. One one comment is to, to see how which I don't know of uh, is to see how many people in Europe that do not have bank accounts. And another comment is that. To, Maybe possibly rightly so that we in Sweden have a higher trust in the government than most other co countries in Europe as well. So um, that that might be the case. Uh, but I mean, and in, in seeing bringing in the European perspective, perspective, I, I of course, the, which we are focusing also in our project. I I I've read, and that's something maybe we could talk about. I, I read uh, just the other day that uh, Italians they have moved away from using cash to um, to um, to cards uh, due to to the COVID for the fear of transmission. Is this something you also experience in the US? Yeah, I'll jump in, but then Hank can talk about San Francisco. But generally, transit agencies across the country actually are not accepting cash right now at all. Okay. Which is wild because that was the impetus for our project with a 10 year, you know, looking 10 years out. Yeah. They canceled cash, you know, March, whatever it was, 23rd, and um, we were just blown away. That was something that they were trying to prepare for in the long, long term. So, and of course, transit use has dropped by 70 to 90 percent, depending on where you are. Yeah. That rebounds a little bit. So we have a kind of a natural experiment right now. The problem is um, the kind of data that you would need to understand who's not riding is mixed up with who's not working. So it's not only the cash, re, you know, credit, smartphone dimension, it's that, you know, only 60% of workers could go online. So the 40% are still trying to take transit, but, you know, somehow they're making it work. I don't know. So it's, it's, um, it is really hard to understand what has happened because of the cash. But right now, agencies across the country are not accepting cash at, in transit. And so, Hank, maybe, I don't know the, the story in San Francisco, but. Yeah, I, I think it's the same story. I, you know, I'm not super familiar with everything that we're doing on the transit side, but yes, we are we're not accepting cash. I mean, San Francisco has been, you know, to tout San Francisco a little more, has been a leader on that in that regard in that we, we're the first city, I think, in the in at least in the United States to to do all door boarding so that people could get on the back of the bus and not just the front of the bus. Um, and that was purely for um, reasons of speeding up boarding. You know that you've, we've all experienced. You know, we're standing behind people who are fumbling with their cash and trying to pay, um, and distracting the driver who's trying to tell them, you know, how much they owe or whatever. So the the practical impact of going to all door boarding was that a lot of people didn't pay um and we and you know i think the agency leaders just sort of made the decision that that was that was okay that the the benefits of moving the buses faster would outweigh whoever didn't pay so we were already we had already kind of taken a big step in the direction of most people getting on the bus and not if they don't want to pay they're probably not going to pay and we're not going to do anything about it um and and i think you know aaron your point about europe I do think that we have a lot of a lot of the challenges that we face are, you know, frankly, because we just don't have as much of a 
social safety net in the United States. And there just are a lot of people who are very poor and really left out of the system and don't have options. And so that means that, so then that, that means that the, the city bus system has to let people ride for free because the the larger political system has just sort of left these folks out and they don't have any money and they don't have any way to get around unless we let them get on the bus for free. Um, obviously a better solution would be to help those folks out with assistance or a job or whatever so that they have money and can pay to ride the bus. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of this stuff sort of filters down and, and like, and, and then we deal with it at the, at the street level. And, you know, I showed the picture of, of, a, a vandalized you know meter where someone had taken them the battery out of it and i don't think anybody wants to be having to steal the battery out of a parking meter in order to you know power the the heater in their tent you know that they live on on the street um, but we've kind of left left people with no choice in a lot of cases and so and so but then that means that our meter shop you know is out there dealing with vandalized meters all the time um because that's that's the sort of situation, the larger situation. But when saying that, I mean, you you still, as I interpreted your pictures in your presentation, Hank, you still have like the, the individual sticks out there for for a lot of not everyone, not every right. parking space, but a, a lot of them. Why? Why haven't you transferred to like a, a block meter instead? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's a good, that's a good question. That's. Um, we we are doing a, a request for proposals right now to replace all of our meters around the city and we're going to move to about 50 percent to be the the multi-space the kiosks pay stations whatever you want to call them and only 50 percent uh the single space parking meters uh but yeah san francisco at least in the united states is one of the i mean i think probably 90 to 95 percent of our spaces are metered with single space meters which is much higher than than any other city that i'm aware of um, and I think it's, you know, it, that's frankly just one of those legacy things, you know, the, the folks who install and maintain the meters, they like them, they know them, um, merchant groups like them, everybody knows, you know, they know which meter is theirs, we install something new, they don't like it, it's different, it's strange, um, but we will be moving to more of the, the multi-space machines. But, but on the other hand, you get a lot, lot of useful data on the exact usage of exact spaces, don't you? Well, we still have, even when we move to multi-space, we, we have a, a pay by space system. So the spaces are oh, marked okay. and you still, um, I mean, I think that's another one that, you know, now, now we're just getting into sort of the, the weeds of, of, of specific parking management, but, you know, we would love to move away. I would love to move away from the pay by space and move towards a sort of pay by block um system it, just because again it's you know like we we mark all the spaces on the street we have little space numbers on the sidewalk mm -hmm. those cost money to install and maintain and they get ripped off and you know all sorts of things like that so it's it would be better to just and cleaner and nicer to just get be able to get rid yeah. of all that so we're trying to move in that direction okay going going back to the to the discussion of uh, um, the mitigations um you you mentioned that for, you, that you were um, forced to let people uh, on board transit uh, and not paying. And, well, the other way to do it, of course, I mean, in, in, I know in many countries you, you uh, give out free public transit cards to people at over the age of 65 or 70, uh -huh. uh, even people uh, like officially uh, registered as involuntary uh, unemployed, like job seekers also get um, a free public transit card. Is this something you also do in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, in, in San Francisco, we do. We have moved in that direction, but it's been piecemeal. You know, we have free Muni for Muni is is the sorry is the term for uh, the transit system in the city. Um, so free Muni for low income youth, free Muni for seniors, people with disabilities, and you know, there's been a movement now to just move to free Muni for all low income people. Um, so we're moving in that direction. But okay, so apparently. yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't know that. Um, ours is just deeply discounted. It's a uh, eighty percent discount for youth in school and over sixty-five, and then ADA has some other programs. Um, but I didn't realize that you all were doing free. But 
I'll just make a comment on this. The R Federal, it's kind of a non-governmental research agency, just uh, started a project exploring fare free transit nationally, like what are what's happening. They want to put out a kind of a white paper on best practices for agencies moving that are considering fare free, entirely fare free, but also market segments. But I think they're they're the undertone of the project I bid on it and didn't win it, but um, is fare free transit uh, more broadly, which is interesting. And, and our agency here is studying it. They have a study group right now on fare free for our system. Um, they, we collect, and typically in the US, about a quarter of the operating funds are collected through fares. So you can see, and about wow. a, a two to three percent are spent gathering the fare. So it's Oh. It is effective still to gather, but it is a lot of effort, you know, millions of dollars put into collecting the fare that would also be, you know, waived if they didn't, uh, if we didn't collect fare at all. Um, but I did want to make a mention about trusts. You know, in the U.S., you know, there are all these, there's a kind of undercurrent of distrust of both the government, but also some technology companies, and we're seeing increasingly you know how our phones track us and and most of that is kind of you know for ads and things like that they're not really trying to track us and we could also imagine how it could be used in kind of more politically contentious times to track political opponents uh, it's we're not quite to that point but we're getting there but a lot of that kind of kind of conspiracy theories are i heard going to europe so I, I think that some of our distrust that you kind of associate with the U.S. I don't. I've heard. I've been reading that those are increasingly yeah. appearing in Europe, where there you have QAnon and all these bizarre groups, yeah. and they're growing. And the, you know we have the, the similar thing here. But I just wanted to throw that out there that you might. Well, well you're absolutely that. right. I look, you're absolutely right. I, I read a report that actually we in Sweden we are the ones uh, sharing the most fake news articles in, on Facebook, etc. So um, in the world, so um, we are uh, we're not only behind, but we up there with you maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly true. But I mean, you, of course, we don't want to you move for a. And that's why we are here uh, for free parking as for for free public transportation uh instead we would like to to target it better and i mean the the recipe for for success for you hang seems to be i mean to to nail down who was the one who would be absolutely excluded and see what can we do with them and it would be really interesting to i mean connect to your your um um uh, final uh, report results in, in the cost effectiveness of different measures and uh, saying, I mean, if you could actually give give people that those, I don't know, two or three percent who would be absolutely excluded a prepaid card every now and then and saying, okay, we see that you can't go in here, you, you are not going in here every day, but maybe you can have this and, and that would mitigate some some of the issue of moving towards automated payment. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good idea and something that we've, we're really just starting to think about you know, that exactly what you said that if there's a way that we could say that certain people will qualify for a prepaid parking card or something like that then then that that starts to go a long way i think to address the problem um and we do have a lot of because we have you know those those programs that i mentioned like free free transit for low income youth and free transit for seniors and we also have um, we have some other sort of discounted programs that we've we've already got the infrastructure to process requests, you know, to evaluate like yes, okay, you you officially qualify as low income, so that you you will get this. Um, <clears throat> so it wouldn't be a whole lot to add on, you know, like okay, so if you already qualify for this other program that entitles you to a free or discounted um, transit pass, then you also qualify for this free or discounted parking pass or, or parking card or something like that. So, yeah, I think it's, um, I think there's a lot of possibilities, you know, the, as with everything um, that we do, there's always a lot of concern about setting precedent and also sort of opening the floodgates. And once people realize like, oh, there's a, 
there's a free parking card out there, you know, I, I'm going to go try to get that. Um, mm. But that's, that's always the case. And it's not, it's, it's not something that good management and, you know, paying close attention can't solve for, I think. I agree. I just want to mention a program we have in Portland. It's called the transportation wallet. And I, and I, it's in certain neighborhoods that are heavily impacted by parking demand. And I think, and, I, and I've not explored it, you can Google it, but there is, um, if you don't have a car or you give up a car, they give you a bundle of services in an account. And I do believe it's maybe recharged monthly. So it's like car sharing, bike sharing, transit. And they, they're trying to basically reduce, you know, the demand for parking. And I'm wondering, are you doing anything on the demand side besides pricing? Are you trying to just, I know that, for example, you have uh, car share at the curb and some apartments and multi-unit are giving, if you have, if you use car share, um, there might be some, you might get a free bike or I don't know, something like that. Um, but are you, how is that going? I know that you were a leading, San Francisco was really leading that maybe 15 years ago with kind of offsetting demand. Is that still yeah, um there, there's there's a lot of that um you know i actually worked on the on the transportation demand management team for a few years uh, before i did what i'm doing now um and we have a lot it's 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 kind of similar to um the the treasurer uh, office programs that i was mentioning where there's actually like a lot of really cool stuff out there but it's just the challenge is letting people know about it and so we do have a lot of really interesting programs that are aimed at um, transportation demand management. But the, the most interesting thing that happened, um, and I, I can't take any, I didn't, didn't work on this project, but I, I worked for the person who was working on it, um, was a, an update to the city's uh, planning code, which was a, the biggest update that we've done in, in many years that essentially said, and, it, and it, it really tied transportation demand management to parking, um, which I, think makes sense because frankly, you know, parking supply and parking pricing are the two best transportation demand management um, tools out there. You know, if you reduce this, if there's fewer parking spaces, fewer people will drive. And if parking costs more money, then fewer people will drive. It's it's really that simple. Um, and it, it basically said, here are, essentially, here's a whole menu of options for ways that you can reduce the people's need for cars. You know, you can offer car share space in the garage, you can offer transit passes, you can offer bike share spaces in the garage or free bike share memberships. You can offer refrigerated storage in the lobby so that people can get their groceries delivered. And then if they're at work until you know later that day, then everything's been in the refrigerator. Um, and all of those things will basically like give you credits. Um, but the thing that gives you the most credit is just not having any parking. Um, and and it, and it's really sort of like a the more credits you do, the more parking you can add, and the more parking you take away, the fewer credits you have to earn yourself. Um, so it's a pretty neat system. But as with all these things, it's only for new developments going forward. Um, and so so old older buildings don't have to adhere to any of those. Um, uh, but anyway, so that that's there's some some cool stuff. Uh, it was just it was called the TDM ordinance, the Transportation Demand Management Ordinance, um, and it, um, you know, we'll see how much impact it has now that development has just completely stopped with the with the economic downturn. But yeah, cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't mind letting you guys talk more, but um, uh, we are soon ending our night here. Um, if there are any final thoughts. No, I mean, I just say thanks very much for the time and um, okay. uh, fascinating conversation. And I, I hope I'm impressed, like I said, that you all made it through an entire day talking about curve management. <clears throat> well, there's a few of us still hanging around here. And I would like to thank you guys for being able to do this talk with us um, early in the morning for you. And uh, thank you to all our, our listeners attending here and, and tuning in throughout the afternoon and, and the early night as well. And um, hopefully we'll be able to get back to you guys as well and seeing how you, you are doing. So yeah. thank you and uh, thank you. good have a good day and good All night right. to the rest of you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks Bye. a lot. Bye. Bye.